No, I'm orbiting you right now. <laughs> of course, they have no idea. They're all spamming in the chat. I can't hear. I, I didn't hear anything. So clearly there must be some audio issue. They'll never hear what I'm about to say to you right now, which will, which will of course be... I know they can't actually go to a black hole and go inside. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just some theoretical thing. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to explain it like it's totally possible, but you definitely, like, probably die anyway. <laughs> They'll never know. <laughs> they can't hear anything anyway. <laughs> What's that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be I'll I'll be on Earth in a second. Oh, hello, and welcome to Office Hours, a live component of the facility where good old Professor Kyle totally doesn't say anything weird on a phone to someone you totally don't know, and invites all of my staff. Great. All, <laughs> all of my staff, all of the nerdy people outside these blast doors to come in, ask good old Professor Kyle anything you might want about science, pop culture, hair care tips, why I'm wearing a ring, all these things. <laughs> and of course, we go through a number of sciencey and pop culture -y topics each week as I'm want to do. Uh, this week, we'll be talking about how to enter a black hole without dying. We'll also be talking about Super Mario 64 speedrunning, which is closer to a sciencey thing than you may think. Uh, we'll also be talking about life under an Antarctic ice sheet and why it's cool and important. And finally, we'll be taking one of your comments from the last episode of the facility, which was a harrowing and not fun mini documentary that I like to put out. But before we get to all that, of course, I'll be reading the chat the whole time. And if you really, really, really want me to read the chat, I'll do my best to read all these super chats coming in, uh, as you can see on the screen right now. If you want to simp for science, get your simp in there. It all goes towards the facility and my plans of orbiting a black hole and trying to go inside and get all in all the information. For example, we have Elizabeth Calvert. Calvert, sorry, I get it. I usually get it right, Elizabeth. Uh, as she usually does with a fifty dollar donation right at the top of the show. Hey, Kyle, love the show as always. My tiny human, Alice. Alex asked, how does energy work and where does it come from? Now, that is a surprisingly difficult question, tiny human. Um, but the simplest answer is that energy isn't really a thing. It's a property that has to be tra a quantitative, uh, a, a property with numbers that needs to be transferred to a thing. A thing can have energy, but energy doesn't exist by itself as like a thing. There's not like a... And this is where... Um, you might hear adults that wear a lot of crystals talk about energy like it's a thing, like, ooh, I can feel that energy or that orb of energy. That's not what energy is. Energy is closer to, like, a unit of measurement. Energy is closer to, like, a foot or a pound as a concept than it is to something like, ooh. Uh, Angie with the 20 says, I've seen some energy. Entertainment sources post headlines about scientists discovering a portal to the fifth dimension. I looked at the study, but I think I need to explain in layman's terms. Thanks, Kyle. Take care. I have no idea what they're talking about. I can, I, I'm not even going to look at it, and I can, I can tell you that no one has figured out how to travel to the fifth dimension. What would it even look like? Who knows? Uh, Vilu South with the $10. Um, and of course, as all this is going on, let's pause the Super Chats. For a second so we can get to our first topic of trying to survive a black hole um, but of course if you want to continue on this conversation well after the stream is done you can always join me at the facility by draping on a silky white lab coat and entering these blast doors as my security team is putting in the chat the link is patreon.com slash kyle hill at a certain tier you get in there and we can talk every day on discord you can see episodes early you can see pictures of all the things that i'm currently failing at like my facility members did today and you get members only live streams with yours truly <laughs> but not like that that's a separate link so why don't we figure out right now how to enter a black hole and some of you in the chat already know this you smarties but if you don't know how mm, let's find out black holes they're more like black spheres, but they're not things. It's like, what if there was a... So it's easier for us to think of two dimensions. Humans are good at thinking of two dimensions, like a flat sheet of paper. Um, 
but of course, space time is not like a flat sheet of paper, is it? No. Space time is in three dimensions x, y, z, and the fourth dimension being time. Uh, time is what those three dimensions move through. So you have four dimensions, but three spatial dimensions. And those three spatial dimensions, a black hole is like a hole in every direction. That makes sense. So if you were to look at a, a circle in two dimensions, if you were to revolve around that circle in three dimensions and look at what the shape was, it would be a circle in every direction. And if you added up all those composite images, it would look like a sphere, a sphere of black. That's kind of what this is. So it's, it's, a, it's a hole. It's not a thing. It's a, it's, an, it's a depression, an extreme gravity well in all directions, such that every direction is down. Who am I, Vsauce now? But, so black holes are obviously one of the most interesting things in the universe, and uh, they're actually one of the most numerous things in the universe. You may think it's stars or planets, but black holes are up there with uh, the most numerous objects. They are everywhere. We think that they're at the center of most galaxies, helping uh, supermassive black holes, helping fling stars and nebulae, gas and dust around these light year long um, arms. <laughs> C373 says, you wish you were Vsauce. Yeah, I do. Anyway, so because black holes are so fascinating, of course, we're always fascinated with what would happen if humans were to interact with them. What would they do to you? What would they do to a spaceship? And this is kind of a basic thing, what I'm about to tell you, but I had never considered it. And so I want to share it with you, because if I've never considered it, I'm going to guess that many of you haven't considered it either. Because what I've been told about black holes and what the public is always told about black holes is that they're very dangerous. They eat everything, and if you were, gonna, if you were to get close to a black hole, you would encounter a fate known as spaghettification and spaghettification is not a fun death Sp spaghettification is the process by which you are strewn out into a uh, eventually like atomically thin tube of person meat that's a fate you don't want why does this happen As you can see on the screen here, this says differential tidal force, okay? So around a black hole, because the depression in space-time is so unbelievably strong, the gravitational field around these things is very steep. So actually, I like this analogy now. Okay, so because it's helping me visualize it. So we have this steep gravity well. Imagine, again, in two dimensions, Outside of the black hole is my microphone. Outside of the black hole, do, 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 do. you're walking along, it's fine. But right near the black hole, this just drops super steep, like you were dropping into the bottom of the ocean or something, you know, Mariana Trench or something like that. So you have this incredibly steep depression around this black hole. But this depression is so steep around a black hole that the difference between standing safely on the ledge and being way down the ledge in terms of gravitational strength, this distance is very, very small. How small? So small that if you approach the event horizon of a black hole, the, uh, the theoretical radius, well, it's an actual radius, of course, but the radius at which the escape velocity from the black hole depression is the speed of light, so the event horizon is the point at, point at which not even light can escape because escape velocity, like escape velocity on Earth, wouldn't just be what a rocket could do. It would be literally the speed of light or greater. That's why it's a black hole. Nothing escapes, not even light. So right at this event horizon, this is the edge that we were talking about with that depression. So if you went and you, again, theoretically, stood or floated near this black hole, 
the difference, remember this steepness that we were talking about, the difference between where your head is in this diagram and where your feet would be, the difference in gravitational field strength there is like a billion times. And so now you have your head not being really pulled on as much. Well, it doesn't matter. You have your head being pulled at with one force and your feet being pulled at with a billion times that force. And this creates a stretching motion, right? And then as you get closer and closer to the black hole, every single part of your body is going to start experiencing this differential gravitational force to the point where you go from normal human person to stretched out atomically spaghetti person. And this is what spaghettification is. And it's what you've always heard with every black hole in public. Whenever someone a scientist person like myself, whenever we talk about black holes, we mention spaghettification, and it's a terrible way to die, and people are, that's why, people like that kind of morbid thing. However, is there a way to safely avoid spaghettification and still encounter a black hole? Theoretically, yes. There's a way you could gently, and without any physical harm, assuming you're in a spacesuit and blah, 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 blah. You could gently pass the event horizon. How is that possible? Well, some, uh, as I said, some of you in the chat already figured this out or knew about it, so let's quickly go through it. This is a solar... Wow. I was whistling like Matthew McConaughey there or something. So this is a solar mass black hole. Now, what a solar... I'll start. A solar ma mass black hole is the black hole the mass of our sun. It's not that big because all the masses would be concentrated in a very small space. It's not that big, relatively speaking. So it has one solar mass. And because of that, the radius here, the event horizon radius, from the center of mass of the black hole to the event horizon is, relatively speaking, not that great. Okay. It's not that the, the radius isn't that uh, isn't that long. Uh, I actually have numbers on that. Uh, this is what scientists call dead air. Okay, so with a solar mass black hole, this radius from the center of mass of the black hole to the edge is like two miles. So with, with, with a sun's mass worth, two miles from there to there, you're going to have an intense gravitational field strength, and that's what's going to create the differential uh, there and pull you apart into spaghetti. But solar mass black holes are not the only kind of black holes. In fact, many black holes are what are supermassive black holes. And supermassive black holes, as the name suggests, um, have much, 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 much more mass, like a billion times more mass of the sun. So these things are going to be huge. Now, naturally, with a larger mass, the event horizon is going to be pushed out further. That's just how the math works out. So now, from the center of mass of the black hole to the event horizon where you would cross into the black hole's complete influence, it's much, much further away. For example, um, a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which there is one, we think, it would have an event horizon with a radius of 7.3 million miles. So now instead of two miles from here to here, you have 7 million miles from there to there. And what that amounts to is that once you're at the edge of the event horizon in the supermassive black hole, the gravity well that we've been talking about, it's not steep like it is here, where you can just fall off the edge and your feet get pulled so much further than your head in the supermassive black hole because it's so far away from the center, it's more gradual. And now that it's more gradual, you can do the math, Standing on the edge, again, standing, standing on the edge of the supermassive black hole, the gravitational field strength difference between your head and your feet is effectively zero. 
So again, if you could find a black hole, be in outer space, be in a spaceship or a spacesuit or whatever, and be fine from the elements, or lack thereof, rather, with a supermassive black hole, you could theoretically float into it, cross the event horizon, and be totally fine. No spaghettification because the basically no gravitational differential. That being said, this would not be an interstellar situation where you send TARS in there and the robot sends back information to you because nothing escapes a black hole, not even information. So while you could float, think of a lone scientist. Oh, this sounds like a nice short story someone can write. Think of a lone scientist gracefully floating into the maw of a black, a supermassive black hole, jotting down all this information, taking all these readings and stuff, and knowing that it's only for their elucidation. They cannot send any information back out of the black hole ever. The only thing they will ever learn about the black hole is what they learn themselves, and no one else will ever know. So it's kind of a, qu a catch-22 in it, where... Yes, sure, you can float inside a black hole, but no one is going to see you ever again. Once you get to the event horizon edge, the image of you is going to be frozen right there because they will receive no more light. So the image of you entering the black hole will be frozen like a picture, and then you'll slowly fade away. And you can imagine that person doing science things on the interior, learning things about the universe no one has known, and never being able to know about it. I think that sounds pretty dang cool, but I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, oh, I should also mention about the black hole stuff. Um, it also, uh, it can't have like an, a, a spinning accretion disk around it that's super, super hot. It, don't want it to be a charge you want it to be isolated um otherwise the super hot accretion disk is just going to vaporize you anyway uh maluk says i liken this to being able to safely jump off a cliff yeah i think that's a i think that's a good way of putting it actually uh yeah sure you can safely jump on yeah uh in soma with the 20 european dollars if we knew a chicxulub size asteroid would be in would unavoidably hit us. Okay, so we build a bunker, keeping all humanity alive with resources for as long as we need. How many years would pass till we could safely repopulate the surface of the Earth? Oh, that, I mean, that would require a lot of calculation. I don't know how long the sun and uh, the atmosphere was affected after the dinosaurs, uh, after the dinosaur impact, the KT extinction event. Um, wasn't there a, a small ice age after that? I mean, it would be, it would not be a short amount of time uh, because the atmosphere is a giant system. The atmosphere is a really, really big system and it takes a long time to go through all that. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure how long it would take, but I mean, this is assuming that we aren't literally ob obliterated. I mean, it wouldn't be that hard. Like if, if the asteroid hit a major population center it would wipe out enough people and cause enough chaos that civilization would probably just collapse anyway um <laughs> there's there's a couple of papers that i've read that more or less say you know a single nuclear exchange between two large countries would basically collapse civilization so i'm guessing that a kt extinction level event um would do the same uh corbin with the 20 says hey kyle love the show hey thanks You've reignited my love for science. That's all I can hope to do, Corbin. Really. I was wondering where you find all your updates regarding the science world. In this information age, it's a headache to find trusted sources anymore. I totally agree with that. Um, well, you know, if you're looking for papers and stuff, I use Google Scholar. I follow all of the, you know, I have RSS feeds of all, you know, science outlets and stuff like that. And just over the, I mean, I, I, I wish I could give you better information but i over the years especially on social media i have kind of um accumulated trusted sources in my feeds whether they be you know direct from journalists or um publications that i trust or friends that i know um 
So I've kind of built up a network of sources that I trust personally. And I, I would suggest you do the same in that you try to try to actively curate your information. Don't 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 necessarily, you know, um wow, there's a lot of chats coming in. I'll get to them. Don't necessarily block out things you don't agree with or you don't want to see all the time, but um, I'd say actively look to um, shape your information environment in a way that you think it's going to be the most beneficial for you. Uh, Thomas, as always with the 20, says, Science is my passion. Should we in the future create the smallest possible stable black hole, encapsulate it in a Dyson sphere, and milk it for energy? Also, black holes are the domain of the flying spaghetti monster. Well, uh, flying spaghetti monster doesn't exist, but black holes do. Um, using a black hole for energy, a black hole engine, is something that's theoretically possible. You get a very, very small black hole, you feed it mass, and you uh, absorb the Hawking radiation, you turn that into heat, you turn that heat into electricity with something like turbines. But that's much less feasible than something like figuring out nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the next step, not a black hole. Cody with the 20 says, hey Kyle, love the show. In the expanse, how does harnessing nuclear fusion translate to more powerful, efficient engines? Doesn't orbital mechanics still dictate travel time? Um, yes, but in the expanse, something like a, uh, well, a fusion engine. So orbital mechanics dictate travel time to a point. There, there's, there's, you know, the alignments of planets and, and stuff like that. You know, you have optimal travel times, but all those curves, all those travel times you've ever seen from like the Earth to Mars assumes a certain velocity or certain kind of acceleration. What fusion allows for is, we talked about this last week, I believe, but uh, no, I talked about this with some students in Scotland over the weekend. Um, but what fusion allows for, chemical rockets right now are very, very powerful for a short amount of time. Uh, ion engines are very, very weak, but for a long amount of time. So you can build up a lot of uh, acceleration. Fusion engines are both. They're really strong, really efficient. You don't, you, like, you don't need a lot of fuel, is what I mean. And they're really powerful. So once you have an, acceler an acceleration that can be sustained, say an acceleration of 1G that would give you the force of Earth's gravity on a spaceship, if you could accelerate at 1G for a couple of days or weeks, um, you will build up so much velocity over time that you will be going fast enough to do what you see people in the expanse do. And it does work out. Those travel times are legit. Um, those really fast travel times. And they all change once you can have a constant acceleration that can go for a long time. I mean, theoretically, you can really get up to a significant percentage of the speed of light just accelerating at 1g for a couple of months um i don't know if that math exactly worked out but it, you know it, it in in a feasible amount of time you can start going incredibly fast so yes fusion engines make that possible because of their efficiency combined with their power um let's keep going i'm sorry it, again if i don't get to your super chat i'm sorry but there's a lot there's a lot of you simps today and I'm not even wearing a pink wig and I don't have braces anymore. AK Dragoon with 20 says, Hey Kyle, Chad from maintenance again. Oh, crap. We ever getting a new section, Chief? After Chief Winters was eviscerated by those Achilles chrysotosis of unusual size. <laughs> no one has stepped up. Maybe Carl? I mean, no one likes him. One sec. Yeah. You know who it is. It says right on the... Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, Chad is inquiring about the new section chief. Well, well, how hard is it to clean an intestine out of an air duct? I, I, uh, uh, Swiffer, wet white, I don't know, whatever you see, whatever those commercials say. I don't, just ask them if, if blood is fun. Uh, sorry, Chad. New section chief. Couple of weeks. We're just getting some uh, some uh, newspaper subscriptions sorted. That's what I was talking about. Don't worry about it. Strongs with the Canadian twenty says, "Hey Kyle, show the love." <laughs> that was me showing the love, specifically for mature students. What? 
Oh, show the love for mature students. It's never too late to go back. For the youngins, it can be so isolating being 10 to 20 years senior to your peers, so befriend the older students in your classes. I absolutely agree. When I was going to engineering school, we had a student in our class who is in his 70s, I believe, and um, they can feel very isolated and ostracized, so I absolutely agree. Um, you can learn at any age, and you should respect that, and you should respect the drive of people who want to do that. Um, Corey with the five says, currently testing conservation of energy with an extreme friction reduction in my Jeep. Stay warm. Love your work. <laughs> yeah, I hope everyone, if there's anyone in Texas watching, I hope uh, you're staying safe and warm. Just a quick note on Texas. Like, why is that all happening in Texas? Well, we engineer for um, common weather systems and patterns. And so, like, for example, if I just happen to be in California, um, you notice that all the roofs are flat. And if you go to a place like Wisconsin, all the roofs are angled. It's because, uh, it's a simple example, but in Wisconsin, when you have a lot of snow and heavy weather, you can't, you don't want a lot of that snow to land on the structure and become a uh, dead load that the roof can't take. So it's shaped like this, so it doesn't. In California, if you were hit with as much snow as you are in Wisconsin, it's flat, it would all accumulate, you'd get this giant dead load and buildings would probably collapse. But we don't get a lot of snow in California so they don't build it that way. Similarly, in Texas, they don't get these extreme cold weather systems very often, if at all. So they don't build their pipes and their houses to accommodate for those extreme temperature changes, which is why we're, need, we're now seeing, you know, climate catastrophe hit Texas. And it's, you know, we're going to be seeing more and more of this as climate change ramps up and up. Let's go to our second topic. You guys want to hear, uh, I've been working on some Mario impressions. Do you want to hear it? I'm going to do it anyway. Let's go. No, higher. Let's go. Oh. Oh. Let's go. That one was good. I know that one was good. I can also do Yoshi. Adam. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> anyway, Super Mario speedrunning. Michael Munlin is in Central Texas. Thankfully, my heat hasn't gone out yet. That's great. Okay, so Super Mario speedrunning. Why am I talking about this? Well, A, you don't know this about me, or one. I love watching speedruns. I love AGDQ, Awesome Games Done Quick. It's a charity one-week stream that happens twice a year on Twitch. It raises millions and millions of dollars for cancer research, um, and uh, it's the single largest donor for Doctors Without Borders. Um, oh, people like the Yoshi voice, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, Rodolfo. Range. That's what I got. Um... Anyway, I love I love speedruns, and one one of my favorite speedruns to watch in the world is a speedrun of Super Mario 64, 120 stars. So these speedrunners, these video gamers, they play the original Mario 64, and they try to um, beat the entire game, get all the stars in Super Mario 64 in as quick as as fast a time as possible. I believe the time right now. Uh, Cheese05 has his time down to like 138 as of last week. Yes, I know that much information about this. Yes, simply. I, uh, cheese. Punkation. Yes, I know all these people. And I watched them. Okay? Anyway, why am I talking about this? Well, when a game is around for long enough and has enough people speedrunning it, like Super Mario 64, one of the most popular and one of the most fun to watch for sure, um, the optimization for every single piece of movement, and I would encourage you to watch one of these videos because the movement these, these dudes have memorized is unbelievable. But it gets very optimized to the point where saving just a few seconds, a few frames, is very important. Now something, I'm sorry, there's, some, there's been something in my eye for like two hours. So something happened that was brought, last year, that was just brought to my attention uh, on Twitter, and it's very interesting. Uh, because it has to do with a sciencey thing. Now, like I said, saving even a few seconds is very important. So, 
when this happened. Warping straight to the ceiling. Just like that. Did you see that? So let's see it again. All of a sudden, in the clock, all of a sudden they are warping from a lower section directly up into the clock. Further up into the clock. Now, if if this was if this was a speedrun glitch that they could pull off repeatedly. This would save a number of seconds, that warp, and it would be very valuable. It would probably probably be added to the speedrun. But no one, can, no one could figure out how this worked. Uh, a speedrunner, uh, forget their name, but they even put a bounty out. They're like $1,000 for anyone who can figure out why that happened. But no one knew. Until they started going through the footage and started messing around with the internal memory of the game, as some uh, speedrunners do to figure out uh, how exactly to do specific glitches and strats, et cetera, et cetera. So now what they're doing to figure out how this happened, they're changing a single byte of information in memory. Now, keep in mind how specific this is. This is changing a single, you know, one to a zero or zero to a one, in one level, at one part of a game, at a certain coordinate, all this stuff. Very, very specific. But if you change the height from C5 to C4, that moment, you get the exact same warping that you see uh, this Dota guy, what he encountered. Okay? Now, that's cool, Kyle. What does this have to do with science? Well, this was an instance, the best explanation is that this was an instance of a single upset event. Now, because our electronics have gotten so good over the years and gotten so small over the years, they are now sensitive to very small things, very small things that are also energetic. So what a single upset event is is some form of ionizing energy coming into a circuit, coming into memory, and literally hitting it and changing the ionization of, the changing the charge structure of the stuff that's going on inside of the computer such that it will flip a sensitive one to a zero or a zero to a one. Now, what I'm talking about here literally is our electronics responding or, or making a single upset event randomly due to ionizing particles coming in from outer space. And this happens all the time. We're being bathed in cosmic particles at all times. They come in with high energy from various sources. They hit our atmosphere and it produces neutrons and protons with a lot of energy and those particles hit other stuff and they can ionize things. So what happened here the best explanation right now, and I didn't believe this when I saw the viral tweet, but the best explanation seems to be that when that speedrunner saved those few seconds in that game you just saw, uh, it was quite literally a random particle screaming in from outside of the solar system, hitting the atmosphere, producing particles, that went into this dude's home, hit his Super Mario 64 cartridge, and changed a specific bit while he was playing to not only change the game in a noticeable way, but to change the game at a specific time and place such that it would help a Mario 120 star speedrun beneficially. The chances that this single upset event would happen in a way that's beneficial to a speed run put on by some hairless apes in some corner of the galaxy. The chances are unfathomable. I mean, unfathomable. Unf they're small. We're talking, you know, one in trillions, you know, like, I mean, this, 
This is the only thing less likely to happen than Dream's Minecraft speedrun. Yeah, I said it. Anyway. But for the universe to conspire, ran well, conspire is an intentional word, isn't it? But for the universe to randomly change the video game in a beneficial way for this very niche, obscure thing, I think is absolutely fantastic and very funny to me. But, you know, what do you have to say? Ruben Flores with the 20 says, uh, hey Kyle, simping for science from Texas and staying warm. Fantastic. The power hasn't gone out here yet, but people in my neighborhood have been coming together to help those without water or electricity. You love to hear it. Um, people, uh, I should say that I have no opinion of the dream situation. I don't even know who he is and I don't care at all. <laughs> Minecraft speedrunning is something that I am super agnostic about. I've never seen a uh, Minecraft speedrun, and I don't care. Uh, Luke Brown says, could it not just be a, a video editing issue? Well, no. With There was a recorded speedrun where this glitch happened, and then the footage on the right that you were seeing was someone altering the memory to replicate the effect. Dr. Strange Joe with the 25 says, that explanation sounds like the explanations the men in black give people in the movies. Oh, you mean like uh, a ray of light reflected off swamp gas, a ray of light from Venus reflected off swamp gas, and that's what, yeah. Also, when are we getting the replication video with the hunk of uranium sitting on top of the console? Replication. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I so, yeah, I, I could artificially induce a single upset event by putting my hunk of uranium that I do have, it's right there. Don't worry about it. It's right there. I could put it on top of my Super Mario 64. I have my original N64. I could put it on top of there and in start to induce those events. But again, even with a directed source from something that I know is going to have an effect, the, the, the chances of that being beneficial to something that I'm trying to do randomly is it, it, it's astronomical. Uh, Jack and Coffee with the 10 says, have you ever watched Mirror's Edge, speed, Mirror's Edge speedruns? Yes, I just did. Um, yeah, I just did, uh, it was uploaded by AGDQ, um, uh, Waifu Runs was commentating it, I forget who the runner is, but it was really, that game is fast, it's really, it's really fun to watch, but I think my favorite, it, uh, Super Mario 64 120 is probably my favorite, or, uh, the Kaizo Super Mario Maker, uh, Relay Races, I really, really love, Major Lee Awesome, <laughs> oh, I get it, with the 10 says, if we travel laterally to a supermassive black hole fast enough, could we just stick our head past the event horizon and speed safely out the other side? Kind of like how the ISS falls around Earth. No. I mean, like, literally, once... I mean, it's going to be very strong right before the event horizon, but past the event... The, the event horizon is the distance at which... Consider, it, consider a black hole like a planet. The event horizon is... If you were past it, it would be like standing on the surface of a planet with the escape velocity faster than the speed of light, which means you would need an infinite amount of energy to escape. Remember, I, I, I guess I made it seem maybe a little bit misleading, but it's not just no gravitational pull and then event horizon, all gravitational pull. It is, you know, it is a slope. So it would be hard. It would be it would get harder and harder and harder and harder and then impossible. Eddie Hart with the ten says, "Hey Kyle, could a land speed record vehicle reach a thousand miles per hour, or is it even possible to reach those speeds on land?" Uh, I have I have no idea. I know you can break the sound barrier on land, um, but uh, I know it's also incredibly dangerous. I don't know and I don't know much about those cars. I know we lost um, Jesse Combs from MythBusters in a speed run test last year, two years ago, so it's incredibly dangerous. I don't know what the actual uh, boundary conditions on, are on a thousand miles an hour. Uh, we got Berthulf with the 10 says, hey, Science Thor, love the show, long time simper, first time streamer. Hey, I see you now. <laughs> Can't lurk from me forever, baby. Parker Brilliant with the 999. Something cool I've learned about speedrunning, that speedrunners will intentionally will intentionally a meticulous move in certain ways to code because beneficial code <laughs> right sentences 
Um, yeah, one of the really fascinating things to me about speedrunning is that these gamers know the game so well that they can set up, they can like literally use the game to manipulate memory in game and then do whatever they want. Um, Pokemon Blue, any percent speedruns do this where they do actions in a very specific order. They even turn the game on. Like, they even like start a new game with like a, a specific time value. Like, okay, I turn it on, then I wait 15 seconds, then I turn it on, then I move this way two frames, and then this way two, and then I talk to this person while doing this. And that's, they, they, it's to the point where they literally manipulate Pokemon Blue memory such that the next thing, they can catch every single Pokemon in a row without moving, and they can walk through walls and all this stuff. It's really cool. Um, just a couple more before we get to our peer review. Jack Fleischer with the 15 says, because the X, Y, and Z axis extend infinitely in directions from the origin... Is there anything to suggest time doesn't do the same? Um, exist infinitely from the past to the future? Um, I don't know the answer to this. I think the standard answer is, you know, time and space. What Were there even time and space before the Big Bang? So then it wouldn't infinitely regress into the past. Could it infinitely progress into the future? I, I suppose so. Um, but what's even more mind-blowing to me is that if the um, continuous nature of time is real, that means that the past, future, and pr the past, present, and future all exist simultaneously, and they're all equally real. By which I mean, the past isn't a memory, and the future just isn't just an idea. It all happened and is happening. Your future self does exist already. It's just in the future. It's just separated temporally instead of spatially. Which then suggests that you have no free will and then suggests that you cannot alter any course in your life and anything that you were going to do, anything that you're doing or going to do was already determined. It's an extreme version of determinism that I happen to um, adhere to, but, eh, you know. What do I know? We got... Let's take one more. SCT Bone! With a 14. Says, here's a properly formed sentence just for you. Keep up the excellent work. You know what? Thank you. It's hard to read. It's hard to... <laughs> it's hard to read. It's hard to try to be smart uh, for like an hour at a time without stopping. So let's see if we can bring it home, baby. So, peer review. As I want to do every week, I take a message or a comment or a correction or something that made me go, hey, 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 from the latest episode of the facility, and I highlight it because I found it interesting. That person becomes an honorary member of the facility, and they get a plaque from Kevin. Right? <laughs> cool. What could go wrong? And... Last week on the facility, we I released another mini documentary in my Half Life Histories, what I'm calling Half Life History series, and that was the Body Snatchers of Los Alamos. Uh, I did a 20 minute or so video. Please watch it if you haven't yet. I think it might be the thing I'm most proud of that I've ever done. Like I think it's really good, <laughs> if I do say so myself, which I do. But um, it's about a a man who died due to a criticality accident in Los Alamos. Um, on New Year's Eve, 1958, in Los Alamos, and um, his body, against his family's permission, was used as the the foundational incident, the the, the foundation of a tissue analysis program for, for plutonium that went on into the 1980s and led to lawsuits and all these other uh, morbid details. You should um, you should really watch it. I think you'll like it, especially if you like uh, true crime kind of stuff. And uh, the reaction that I get to these mini-documentaries has been fantastic. This one isn't doing well. Uh, I think that's because not many people know about it, but I'm, I really like what we did. And others did too. And sometimes I get comments where I feel like we've really done something and, and really changed someone's perspective or even someone's life with some information. And, and this one's no different. So I wanted to highlight a comment from Alex Blocker, who says, uh, Thanks for researching and producing this video. I believe my family was part of the settlement that you mentioned. Grandfather worked in Lab N5 through the 50s, through the 70s, 
uh, Department of Energy settlement for tissue sample samples without consent. Exactly what we were talking about in the video. This is more informative than what happened about what happened than anything I've seen previously, and it means a lot to me. Edit. I just confirmed with my mother that her father was indeed part of the tissue analysis program in 1971 and were part of the lawsuit and settlement. She just watched this video and really appreciated it. It's more context and information on this than what she's seen out there before. She's on a hunt now for the book you mentioned. Thank you again. So, <laughs> I unintentionally led this family to uncover information that their relatives were part of this secret plutonium tissue analysis program in the 50s up through the 80s and now his mother is trying to find the book by eileen oh, i have it somewhere but uh, eileen wellsome it's called the plutonium files it's a very thick book um her articles on which the book is based won a pulitzer prize um and uh yeah i'm i'm very proud to be able to bring that kind of information to you and, and to people who it can um, affect their lives in a real uh, interesting way. So I wanted to highlight you, Alex. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, for commenting that on the video. It's, it feels, feels like we, we, we've actually done something and it's, and it's good. So, um, so thank you. Alex, you are now an honorary member of the facility. Fantastic! Celebratory coffee drink! Oh, uh, what? What do you mean no pl- I am going to literally eat your fi- Alex, I'll be right back. I'm going to get your plaque, probably. Just <laughs> one sec- Please forgive me. Uh, I'll be right back after this, this short commercial break. So just a couple more minutes here. We'll take more of your questions for uh, Senor Beardson. I should say a little update. I do have my, I'll, I'll post a video about it or something, but um, I, my uh, high-end streaming PC, and full peripherals, everything, did come in today. It is set up. It is running. So next week, everything's going to be smooth. Oh, we're going to be 1080p, 60 frames. Oh, we're going to be good. Or I just might uh, abandon all this and just start playing Escape from Tarkov. We have Mateus with the 50MX. Don't know what that is. Greetings, Kyle. Great video presentation. You mentioned spaghettification death. What else would you die of in space? Saludos a todos. Buenas noches. Um, what, ca what else can you die of in space? Uh, well, the immediate thing, clearly, is um, suffocation. No breathing. Don't give a if I cut my own breathing. Um, but uh, lack of oxygen. So without a without a helmet, um, you will lose consciousness in around 15 seconds without oxygen getting to your brain, and about 90 seconds is the point at which you can no longer be revived. Um, a lot of people were uh, talking to me about that on Twitter in relation to the new season of The Expanse, where someone is exposed to vacuum on purpose. Um, but it is possible to be revived after being exposed to vacuum, but yeah, you, you, you pass out almost immediately, and then you die. Um, you could be hit by a gamma ray burst. You could, uh, you could, uh, enter, you could uh, be captured by a planet and enter the atmosphere and burn up. Uh, space, every single thing about space is deadly. So, pick your poison. Except there's no poison in space. That's not true. Mo I'm going I'm to guess that uh, most atmospheres in the universe are poisonous. So that's another one. That's why, that's why, you stupid sci-fi scientists, that's why you don't immediately land and take off your helmet. Your eyes might fill with, like, hydrofluoric acid in the atmosphere, you dummy. That It's your fault that that thing attached to your face. Don't poke stuff, especially if it looks like that. 
like a some sort of earth tube. <laughs> Uh, Pyrofossil with the 20 says simpin for knowledge, except they don't spell knowledge correctly. I'm going to forgive you on this one. Uh, <laughs> Jack and Coffee again with the 5 says, dig the Hubble Deep Field background for the commercial break. Hey, you noticed it. Yes, that's the Hubble Deep Field. Um, so many galaxies. It really makes you feel small. Jason Lowenthal with the 5 says, oh my God, I just remembered that we're landing on Mars again in two days. Hashtag simp for science. Uh, yeah, uh, I haven't been following that very closely, but we're always, we're always sending something somewhere. Uh, Andrea Tipidoro with the 10 says, Hey Kyle, love the show. Putting aside ethics, could it be possible to improve your body by bonding animal DNA to ours? Uh, yes. We have the technology right now to become, as uh, you would say, transgenic. And trans uh, transgenetics would be uh, the process of inserting animal genes into our own genome, or more specifically, you would insert... Uh, different animal genes or even plant genes or whatever into a fetus or into a growing embryo and they would uh, develop and then express those new genes. Um, we've done that. I mean, we've, take, we've taken jellyfish DNA and made kittens glow in the dark, literally. Um, we do this right now, uh, tr transgenic crops with um, DNA from animals in the crop DNA to give them beneficial properties to make them sweeter, grow faster, grow bigger, all these things. We've genetically engineered a lot of stuff. And we could make humans bigger, faster, stronger, whatever, with transgenics if we wanted to, but we don't because of ethics. So to answer your question, without ethics, if you're in a place like Rapture, you know, Bioshock, could you transgenic, transgenetically engineer humans to be some more super-ish kind of human. Yes, absolutely. But we don't because ethics. And that's something that uh, we as a society have yet to figure out. Um, and, you know, I, of course, I mean, it's a very, very, very difficult question because when you're editing DNA like that in an embryo, does the embryo have permission? They have informed consent. Not only are you editing the embryo's DNA, but if that person goes on to then reproduce, they're also going to pass on that edited DNA. And do those children, do, that, do those offspring, do they have a chance to, to give permission or not? Do they want to be edited? So it's a very complicated situation, which I do not have an answer for. Um, Sinan says, do you think governments will test new worlds with prisoners first? No. No, I do not. That seems... I, you would have to get people to politically seems like a pretty dead issue to me the Reichenek with 10 says it's been a while hey buddy glad to catch just the tail end just a friendly reminder that you are doing awesome oh yeah prove it I've been I'm, I'm almost I feel like I'm literally almost out of ideas a couple months ago I was like three episodes in the can but now I'm running out of Things are, I mean, if, you, if you've been on Patreon today, uh, my Patreon, you know that something recently just failed. Things are, I'm fine. The Dr. Dank with the dank 20 crispy nugs says, <laughs> hello, love the show. What do you think life on Earth would be like if Earth had a ring instead of a moon? Well, obviously that would influence, I get, I've gotten this question a couple times, but um it's very difficult to say because the moon does a lot. Not just the tides, but for example, just to take one example, because I don't know all the knock-on effects, but just one example is you wouldn't have the same day-night cycle. You wouldn't have the same source of light for animals that are nocturnal, and that would lead to a completely different evolution, maybe not completely, but a very different evolutionary pathway for nocturnal animals, if there would be nocturnal animals at all, would their eyes change, would their feeding habits change, blah, 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 blah. It would change a lot in the ecosystem. Um, and that's just one, ex think of all the other knock-on effects that might have. So uh, it would, I think life, life would be different, but it's impossible to say because evolution draws on random mutations and I, and I can't say what mutations would arise because again random Johnny's videos of the five says how to survive spaghettification send in a robot avatar that you control through VR 
until you lose the connection in the event horizon. No, I, Johnny, Johnny, maybe, maybe people aren't, aren't understanding me here, but if you, once something passes the event horizon, if it's a thing with mass, it will take literally an infinite amount of energy to pull it out. So if you attach yourself to a, a, a robot with a tether, it would pull you into. Um, it's a bottomless pit. You, you, you can't just dip a finger in. You can't just throw a fishing line in to a black hole or whatever. It would literally, well, it would snap the tether or something. But um, there's no way that we know of physically to get back out. Full stop. Uh, Zach Hernandez says, could specific adaptations be isolated reliably? Um, well, what you're talking about is, so to answer your question, yes. Um, in nature, there's many, many instances of what is called convergent evolution. And that's when many different kinds of animals and organisms all evolve a similar adaptation, whether that be eyes, which evolved independently many times, or echolo echolocation, different kinds of locomotion. And... And even though I say, and it's true, that evolution draws upon random mutations, it does make sense that if the same natural selection process is happening in similar environmental conditions, providing similar pressures, then that randomness is going to be directed towards similar outcomes, right? Um, if seeing is incredibly beneficial in two different environments then it would make sense that it's more likely for them both to evolve there or it's less likely for one to have eyes and one to have totally not eyes Do you know what i mean so even though evolution by natural selection is has no will or direction when the environmental pressures are exactly the same it shouldn't surprise you that what comes out of evolution is similar across different animals in similar environments because the pressure the, the literally the selection process is similar so same selection process from random data, um, you're probably going to get similar results. And we see that. That's why evolu evolution is so cool. Like, it, it, is, it is literally the unifying theory of biology. If we're wrong about evolution, none of biology makes sense anymore. So when people say, like, oh, well, evolution is just a theory, it's like, dude, you don't even know. You don't even know. You're not, you're not even wrong. Like when they disparage evolution because they think it's only like, it's just an idea. No, it's like, no, no, dude. If evolution is wrong, everything in biology textbooks is wrong. A lot of power behind it. A lot of explanatory power. That's the benefit. Um, so we just have a few more minutes. I'll take one or two. Um... Pedraic McGraw says, what happens to a couple of tin cups connected by a string when they stretch an event horizon like, like this? Do I still get to hear my mates? No. Um, so if you had a tin can telephone and, and one side uh, was inside a black hole, one side was outside of a black hole, um, the, the information that is being transferred is a is a vibration, right? You, you're, you're speaking. Uh, the pressure waves in the air vibrate the string, and those vibrations go to the other can. The can vibrates, vibrates the air. You hear the vibrations in the air, that sound. But ask yourself, in a, in a, in an in a gravitational field where the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light, literally, could those vibrations travel up the string fast enough to escape? inside of that gravitational field, the mass is being accelerated so quickly down into the black hole that those vibrations would not get back out. Um, and that sounds crazy, but you can see we did a video on this too. Like There's analogous situations where in, in a fast-flowing river, if you, make, if you throw a, a rock in the river, the ripples don't go faster than the water itself, and so the ripples never never actually travel up the river. This is the same thing. Oh, I think. Black holes are hard. And as always, 
Music Central Piano 29 with a 51-23 at the end of the stream. Keep up the great work, Kyle. These videos are more needed and appreciated than you know. Keep educating and entertaining. Stay rational and safe. Also, neat Papa, <laughs> good Papa Roach reference. Hey, if I'm good for anything, the sick Papa Roach reference. And the tail end, oh, you just got in here, Jeffrey, with the 10 says, Hey, Kyle, I've been watching your content for a while. It inspired me to study electric engineering in college, and I'm proud to say that I graduated recently. Thank you for all the nerdy inspiration over the years. Well, Jeffrey, you just made my day. I think you mean electrical engineering, but whatever you mean, I'm so proud of you. I know that is, I know those courses are hard. The, the, the course load is difficult. It stretches your brain in different ways, but you got through it. You graduated. I am so, so proud of you and so honored to be in any way a small part of your educational journey. So I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Stay passionate and stay nerdy. Wow. I love ending the stream on a note like this. We talked about a lot. We talked about Entering a black hole, we talked about Super Mario speedrunning, aided by cosmic particles, literally. Oh, we didn't even talk about this, did we? <laughs> we found, like, cool sea life under Antarctica, but I guess I'll never tell you about that. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want to continue on this conversation after this is live, this will be posted to YouTube if you're just joining us, but if you want to continue on this conversation, you can go, you can go as my security team is putting in the chat. You can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill right now and join us on Discord where I'm lurking every single minute of every single day, probably. You get episodes early, get behind the scenes photos, and you get private, private live streams of me to you. Not like that. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Um, I hope you're staying safe, staying healthy, adhering to public health guidelines. Um, I will see you next week live, but this week at the facility, I believe the video will be, it's either going to be something about nuclear power or how I totally failed at that chain thing that all of you sent me. And I hurt myself pretty good. So look forward to that. And I look forward to hearing from you next week in the chat. Have a wonderful weekend and rest of your week. Finish it out strong. We can do this. It's 2021. Be nice to each other. Because this is all we got.